one of the most important things you've got when you've got your life cast is obviously to make a master mold of it. Now you don't want to take your original life cast and start working on that necessarily because anything could go wrong and you don't want to damage your original life cast because it's the only one you have. So what you want to do normally is to take your life cast, clean it up, get rid of any imperfections, any air bubbles or any artifacts like seam lines or ball cap lines that you will have accumulated during the casting process. And then at this stage, once it's all cleaned up, you've got your original plaster that's nice and clean and ready to go. Then you would do what is known as a master mold. And typically this is done with silicone and you would then make a copy of this plaster face so that you've now got uh, the opportunity to, and, a, and a really nice mold to make other duplicates later in different materials. So let's pop over to the workshop and have a look at the different processes and materials involved in making a simple master mold. So the silicon that I'm using here is Dow Corning 3481, which is a sort of generic molding silicone, which a lot of people use. And the catalyst here you can see is blue. And when you mix this into the silicon, it will obviously go smooth color. So that's how you know when you mixed it properly, because you can see you've got a nice even color. So this mold here, this is the plaster face core that I've got. And this is basically a plaster face that I've cleaned up. I've dressed the sides down with more plaster. Sometimes people do this with clay, but I like to do it with plaster. And it just gives you a nice, neat, smooth finish all the way around the outside. Um, and I've attached it to a board, a baseboard here, which is basically some uh, chipboard or furniture board. And the important thing about this is that it's not porous. It's actually covered with a formica kind of plastic coating. And that allows me to be able to work on here and peel stuff off without it actually bonding to the surface. So what I'm doing here is I'm drizzling on uh, the first layer of silicone. And I'm using uh, the tongue stick or a wooden tongue depressor to just drizzle it all over the surface and I massage it into the deep areas things like eyelids and the corners of lips and places where you would normally expect to get air bubbles because you would trap air during this part of the process ears are particularly tricky as well because as you can see the silicon is a fluid and it wants to run off and, and go downwards because of gravity but obviously I need it to go up into the corners of the ears and underneath and all those tricky areas so this is going to take a few layers to achieve but the idea is to kind of just cover the whole thing uh, gently and go down onto the base as well we actually want to extend out onto the board uh, a couple of inches like a halo all the way around because this is going to be uh, unfortunately it's called a flange but this flange area here is something that we can grab a hold of when we want to open up the mold later so it's good to make sure that your silicon extends all the way down to the base and onto the board so here I'm using um, an air gun uh, just uh, an empty there's nothing in it it's just the uh, an airbrush that's been connected to a compressor and I'm using it to blow air onto the surface. And what this is doing is it's helping to pop any air bubbles that might be trapped in there. Uh, and it just go all the way around and just blow out these air bubbles like this. And it'll just help you get a nice first coat all over. So when that's all over and done, I'm just going to leave that to go. It's going to take a couple of hours to set. So I just go make myself a cup of tea while that's all setting up. And then we'll come back to this for cast uh, layer number two. Now, unfortunately, on here, you'll see I've got some tiny air bubbles that crept through the plaster. I think it's to do with the way that when I work with plaster on top of plaster, I always soak the plaster overnight to make sure it's completely saturated. And I think basically the air that was escaping through the plaster has been trapped by that first layer of silicone. So what I ended up doing is when that first layer had set, I just went around with a pair of tiny nail scissors and snipped the ends off just to expose them so that when the next coat of silicone went over the top, it covered them over. So on this next layer of silicon here, you can see I've put some pigment into it so that I can see where I've been. I think it's very important that you don't accidentally miss somewhere. So if the both coats of silicon were the same color, you wouldn't necessarily see where I'd gone. So here you can see quite clearly the darker layer is showing up against the first layer. And so I can see where I'm, I've been and I'm making sure I haven't missed anywhere. Again, making sure to take care to go all those awkward areas like under the ear and those tiny little sort of overhangs and undercuts where it's very difficult to actually even see. You've got to kind of feed in as much as you can uh, and expect to sort of scoop it back on top. We've got a good hour or two with the silicon, so I'm not in a hurry with it, but you just want to make sure that you do get it all the way up inside those uh, nooks and crannies because it, it's very easy to miss those bits. Here again, I'm doing the same thing. I'm blowing some air onto it 
to sort of ensure that I don't trap any air bubbles and to try and uh, get as nice a surface as possible. Now here you can see these air bubbles are being persistent and so what I've done is I've gone in very carefully with a pair of nail scissors and just trimmed them off carefully to expose the tops and the next layer of silicon I should put on there I'm just going to massage into these little holes just to ensure it's a bit of a nuisance and you know it took me five ten minutes to fix it all but it is something that is easily fixed like I say with a careful bit of snipping and some nail scissors. One idea I had to deal with the numerous tiny little bubbles was to use a small blowtorch that I've got, like a creme brulee kind of torch. And if you just basically blast those bubbles very quickly, um, just to sort of bake the tops off, and then you can kind of rub the tops and then they kind of break away, and that worked quite well. Just be careful. So this next mix, I'm going to do a little bit more. So as you can see, I'm measuring this out into a larger paint kettle and I weigh everything out. It's very important that you weigh stuff. You don't just kind of eyeball it. You want to be accurate that your catalyst is the right. This particular catalyst is measured out at 10% by weight. So whatever the volume of silicon is or the weight of the silicon, I should say, you need to make sure that you know what that is in, in grams so you can work out the correct percentage and pour in your catalyst and again you've got to be very thorough when you mix mix right down to the bottom of the bucket and scrape the corners to make sure you get all the way down into those nooks and crannies because it's very easy to miss spots and then you know you'll have bits of uncatalyzed silicon in the mix when that's done I'm now going to add a thick tropic. I've got here some Xiameter which is the thickener that Dow Corning uh, produce for their silicones. It works really well in both platinum and tin cure silicones and as you can see I've just put a little scoop in here and then mix that in and it pretty quickly turns the whole mixture into a kind of a, a paste like a kind of a thick mayonnaise-y kind of consistency. And it's very important that you put the thickener in after you've added your catalyst because obviously if you add your thickener first it just becomes a stiffer mixture and then it's harder to actually mix in the catalyst which you need for the silicon to actually cure. So I always add the silicon catalyst first and then once that's thoroughly mixed then I will add my thickener. Now the purpose of that thickener is to make sure that when I put some silicon on the surface it actually stays in place. Now the first couple of coats we wanted them really runny so that we're going to all the details. Now that we've got the details covered with a couple of layers we can now afford to build up some thicker volumes. So what I'm doing is putting this all over the surface making sure again to massage it into all these deep sort of nooks and crannies and covering the whole thing. And again this time it's a different color because I haven't put pigment in it and, and so it's very easy for me to see where I've missed. So if you just alternate your colors as you go that way you're far less likely to miss anywhere. Now it's very hard to see obviously through this exactly how thick it is everywhere because it's opaque. You can't see where your thick areas are. So you've kind of got to do it by touch. So the idea is to sort of put all of the silicon that you've mixed onto the, uh, the head. And then once it's there, try and smooth it out so it's an even thickness all over. It's like I say, you kind of have to feel your way. You can't really see through it. So if you feel the hard bit of plaster underneath and you know you've gone too far, you need to sort of scoop some up and, and cover the, the, the silicon on the high points. The high points like the nose and the chin and the, the ridge around the collarbone there, they tend to be the thinnest areas because obviously when you're wiping and working over the surface, those are the bits that stick out. So they tend to get to wiped clean more often. So you've got to make a special effort to make sure those high points do get covered with the silicone. I'm a big fan of using these wooden tongue sticks. I call them tongue sticks because they're the kind of thing the doctor would use to depress the tongue when looking down the throat. But um, you may know them as waxing spatulas or mixing sticks, depending on how you come across these little sticks, but they're perfect for this kind of thing. And what I'm going to do with this tongue stick is as the silicon is starting to set, but not fully set, I just tend to drag all over the surface very lightly just to smooth it out. Now I'm not pressing hard. I'm not trying to displace and move large volumes of silicon. I'm just trying to dress the surface down so that it's a little neater. It's kind of like icing a cake, really. It's a pretty satisfying job to do. Now that we have that on, and before it completely sets, I'm actually going to cut up some of this stuff. Now, I call this stuff scrim. Some people call it jute, or fabric, or burlap.
um, but whatever you want to call it this is stuff that's used a lot with plaster and you normally get this wherever there are plastering supplies and what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut this up into little pieces and I'm going to dress this all over the surface of the mold so by cutting them up into pieces like this I can then fit them around the, uh, the entire surface of the mold and I'm going to massage them into the silicon which isn't quite set yet it's very important that you get it on there before it completely sets because you can push down onto the scrim and you'll see that the silicon underneath kind of squishes through the holes that's what's great about this material uh, because the silicon will pass through and then basically it meshes it in there and the reason we're doing this is to create a layer of reinforcement so that we don't have to make the silicon too thick but it's also very very strong and very durable so if you had to do multiple pulls out of a mold where you're going to be manhandling it and grabbing it and pulling it out um, it's quite nice to put some kind of fabric reinforcement inside there are different kinds of reinforcement you could use but I'm using this stuff because it's really cheap and it's really strong but if you wanted something with a bit more flexibility I would suggest using either lycra or some kind of power net which is like a mesh similar to this but it's much more flexible but in either event the idea is to embed the fabric into the surface of the silicon before it sets so that you've got a complete sort of surface over the top that's covered and it will create a much stronger mold now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to cover this whole thing with cling film or saran wrap depending on what kind of stuff you'll you have near you um, and this stuff is just food plastic you know food wrapping plastic smoothed over the surface and then I can use a sponge to massage that in and, and work it in and the reason I'm doing this is so that I can um, get a smoother surface without actually having to sort of put any kind of solvent or thing on the outside so if you just smooth all this down with the plastic then your hands don't really engage with the silicon so as you can see here I'm not wearing gloves so my hands don't get dirty because I've actually covered it in plastic and then you massage all that in get that smooth and then just leave the plastic in place overnight so that it completely sets up with the plastic in place and then in the morning when we peel this off we should have a smoother surface without any bits of fabric or silicon sticking up because obviously once the silicon is set you can't really move any around you just have to cut those off so by smoothing it out like this it's just a very sort of quick and economical way of producing a smoother surface whilst that's setting up I'm actually going to make some keys so here you can see I've got some plastic channel it's a kind of a U shaped uh, plastic channel uh, I just get this from a hardware store and what I've done is I've just stopped the ends up um, with a lump of plastiline and I've mixed up some silicone and I'm going to fill these two channels with the silicone to make two long strips so again I'll just leave this overnight to set up and then in the morning I should be able to peel those out and I will have two long runs of silicone Obviously, when you're doing this stuff, you need to make sure you do it on a level worktop because if the table is not level or the workshop table is not level, you're going to find that the silicon kind of runs to one end more than the other. Then you end up with a silicon wedge rather than a strip of solid silicone that's even throughout. And as you can see, I've basically got a long snake of silicone, which I can then cut up into little sections. And the idea of cutting up these little sections is these are going to be used as keys later on. So it's a very quick and economical way of producing a lot of keys quickly without having to get any kind of expensive material in. So here you can see the silicon has set up and I can peel away my cling film and as you can see I've got a relatively smooth surface. There is some texture to it but I'm going to give it another coat of silicon anyway. But uh, it's definitely much smoother than if I just left it to its own devices. If any bits are sticking up still that are in the way because um, sometimes you trap air bubbles and you don't get a perfectly smooth surface you can kind of go in there with a pair of scissors and snip them out but using the cling film has minimized how much of this I have to do so I quickly mix up another batch of silicon this time with some red in it so it's very pink and I'm gonna use this final coat partly to smooth over the surface and partly to create a new layer here for the keys to stick into so freshly poured silicon should bond to freshly applied silicon and by squishing these in like this and then smoothing out the edges I can basically apply my keys into the surface and they'll all sort of stick and bond together and become one thing once they've all joined 
and you can see that it's very easy for me to navigate around corners and curves with small sections of key rather than keeping it as one long key and expecting it to bend around all these corners because over time silicon sets up it might you may have find that the um, you know the long strip of silicon would want to straighten out and wouldn't sit into the corners and curves in the way I'd like it to so by cutting them up into sections it's much much easier for me to just put the keys where I want them and if they're too long you can just trim them down and cut them shorter one little job I do like to do is to kind of neaten around the base of each key with a tongue stick and just smooth it out just to check that there's no air bubbles and to get rid of any kind of uh, folds or bulges of silicon that collect because when you squish down the key into the fresh silicon it kind of displaces some and you end up with a big blob around the bottom edge. And these could cause little undercuts and things later on so I want to try and make the thing look as smooth and neat and professional as possible. So once all the keys are in, I'm going to do the same thing with that tongue stick and try and smooth it out. But before it completely sets, I've got one more trick up my sleeve. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use some dishwashing detergent. So here you can see I've just got some normal dishwashing or fairy liquid or whatever the kind of dishwashing detergent you can get a hold of. I've got some of that in a cup and I've mixed it with some water. I'm just going to stir that up and that's going to make basically like a slippery kind of lube that I can paint all over the surface. And I can smooth that out and just smooth it with a brush or indeed with your hands. And if you do this as the silicon is setting, you can get a really nice smooth finish. You can get an almost pebble smooth kind of finish on the outside. Um, and the great thing about it is, is that, you know, just it's cheap, it's very easy to find, it's very easily available. Um, you can use um, something like isopropyl alcohol for the same thing, which is quite nice because it does evaporate and doesn't leave a residue behind. However, it really stinks the place up and it's very flammable. So because this is a very large surface area, it's safer and sensible and cheaper for me to just use dishwashing detergent thinned down with water. There we go, job done. So now we're on to the next stage, which is to, to let this set up completely and then I can do the plaster jacket on the outside. So in preparation for that, what I'm going to do is I'm now going to trim off the excess around the outside. So I'm going to keep about an inch away from the keys and follow the shape as close as I can around the outside. And with a scalpel, I'm just going to slice off the excess and carefully peel it back. So you can see now I've got a really nice, neat edge to the silicon. And you can even see the different layers of silicon as I've cut it through like strata in some kind of exposed rock face in the ground. Okay, so we're ready to do our mold wall. So for this, I want to make this jacket in two parts. I could probably make the jacket that supports this in one piece, but if I was to fill that uh, silicon later with a rigid material, I might have a hard time getting it out or it might damage the mold trying to get it apart. So it makes sense for me to try um, and put the effort in now because you only make the mold once, um, but I might need to use the mold lots of times. So if I make the mold easy to use and easy to open later, then I'm going to be very grateful that I took the time to do that. So what I'm going to do here is take some clay. This is water-based clay, just regular gray clay. And I'm going to use my clay cutter with a board to cut some slices of clay up. So this is, they're about 10 millimeters thick. So I can cut my slices a uh, consistent thickness. And then I'm going to cut them up into strips to make a series of uh, clay strips that I can use to make the clay wall. There are again lots of different ways of doing this. This is just my preferred method of doing it. So what I'm going to do is lay the strips around the outside here. And the reason I'm doing this is to provide a nice clean uh, wall so that the plaster doesn't go everywhere when I'm doing it. These are sometimes known as granny walls and a lot of very good mold makers would frown upon this because it's, it's trying to make my life a little bit easier but it's also kind of lazy. Um, so you can keep this, uh, skip this step if you'd rather not do it but I am going to do granny walls on this because I'm feeling lazy. So I build up a little thickness, maybe about an inch or so all the way around. And I use this tool. This is a little uh, small tool or spatula tool, um, which is really good for uh, doing the fine work on edges and stuff with clay. Once that's done on one half, I'm then going to lay my mold wall down the center. I figure out where the center line is. And I cut these strips up because they're much easier at bending around corners. I can feed this stuff around corners and, and get it into all the nooks and crannies to follow the shape correctly and just build one layer up on top of the other, on top of the other, until I've got the wall the correct height. 
it can get a bit fiddly in corners where you've got to cut it round to, to fit into the existing shape of the silicon and navigate over keys and things like that. But that's why I like to do little strips because it's very easy for me to kind of cut the shapes into the clay at this stage rather than trying to cut a very complicated shape into one big piece of clay. As you can see, being clay, it's very easy to add more. So I just put little blobs in there, pack out some of these hollow spaces, and then I can fill that up with um, some nice bits of clay and then add my pieces over the top to quickly build up a nice even wall. So layer upon layer upon layer, I build it all up, make sure the wall is straight and neat. And then once that's done, what I'm then going to do is go over the back side of it with some plaster bandage. So this is on the back. This is the side that I'm not going to mold up against. And the reason I'm putting plaster bandage on this side is to make sure that the clay wall is strong so that when I push against it to lean it up, which I'm going to do shortly, I don't want the clay to keep moving every time I push against it. So by putting this clay wall on um, this plaster bandage wall against the clay, it creates a temporary wall, which is going to be strong enough to keep its shape. So as soon as that's set up and it's firm, I can then use my clay tools or, you know, to kind of smooth things out so I can push against it to make it nice and neat. And because the wall is supported from behind with the plaster bandage, it doesn't shift. So that actually allows me to press quite firmly and just drag the clay smooth to get a really nice finish. And as you can imagine, if you were doing this and halfway through the whole wall detached and moved because of the pressure you're putting against it, it's very frustrating. So that's why I put that bandage there to keep it in place. Tiny little nooks and crannies, you can just add more clay. The beauty of clay is that it all blends into itself. So just put in little bits of clay, smooth it up against the surface with a small tool and just kind of smooth it out. So once that's done, I'm going to smooth it out with my finger and then I'm going to add my keys. So the purpose of keys is to create unique shapes in the wall so that the other side of it, when they're made, will connect together in the same place every time. So it's a very positive fixing place and that's why they're called keys. Sometimes they're called joggles or some people call them locators, but the idea is just to put something into the wall because obviously a flat surface, it's a bit ambiguous as to where exactly it should go together. So by putting in keys, you just take out the guesswork and you can be sure that when the two halves go together later, they always go back together in the correct place. I often use a small brush and a bit of water to help smooth out any bits and bobs. And with working with clay like this, you've got to be very careful that you don't, you know, damage the clay wall that you've made so smooth. So you've got to keep things very, very neat and tidy as you work with clay. So once I put my keys on, it occurred to me that the top of this mold would do a better job if it was flat and then it would actually sit on a tabletop better because it was the right angle so I realized I hadn't done this I just suddenly realized that it would be really good to make the, the top of it flat so what I did was at this stage after having done that I actually sliced it with a tool and then cut that off to make a nice even smooth shape you'll see a bit later this comes into play so having done that I now spray this with a layer of wax this is just an aerosol uh, wax release spray it's a basically a beeswax that's suspended in a solvent with some propellant. And so you can spray that onto the surface and you get a nice even fine coat of wax all over the surface without actually touching it. So here the plaster I'm using is Cristocal R, which is a reasonably hard plaster available here in the UK. Um, and I mix it in by adding powder to the water. And then when I've got this kind of effect where it looks like a slightly dried cracked riverbed, that's when I think there's enough plaster in there. It could probably do with a tiny bit more, but I'm being a little bit cautious because I want a slightly runny mix on this one. So I'm going to mix this up really well into these bowls. Um, they're called splash bowls over here, and they're basically like plasterers bowls, and they're great because they're flexible, so you can squeeze them to uh, you know get rid of uh, dry plaster later. But they're also uh, round, so you can mix them up really, really quickly, and you can kind of pour, you can squeeze them and use them like a spout for pouring as well. So they're really good bowls, these, these plaster as splash bowls. So I'm going to brush in the first coat all over very quickly. Again, the idea, as we did with the silicone, was to get into all the details and get those finer points taken care of, especially around each key. It's very easy to accidentally miss a bit. Um, so you want to make sure you put plenty in there and brush all over the surface, punch out any air bubbles and get a nice thin coat over it quickly. You don't have a long, long time with this. You probably got a good 10, 15 minutes before it starts to thicken up. But you don't want to hang around. You want to get that plaster on quickly and you don't want to agitate 
the clay surface too much because your brush may disturb the clay and you'll end up sort of mixing the watery plaster with the watery clay and end up with a bit of a mess. So as it starts to thicken, you can see I add more and more and more. If I dumped it all on in one go, there's a danger it would just kind of run everywhere and fall off and, you know, I'd end up with more plaster on the floor. So you want to add a little bit at a time. And as it starts to thicken up, it gets this really nice kind of um, cheesy kind of state where it starts to, if, first like mayonnaise, then like mashed potato, and then it kind of goes all sort of pasty like kind of butter um, and you can smooth it and use different tools to kind of strike off the edge this business here of, of cleaning up the edges is known as striking off so you want to strike the edges so that they're nice and clean because obviously when plaster sets it, beco it becomes rigid so if you've got any bits overhanging the edge that are left unattended they'll just set there and then end up with something that kind of is going to make doing the other side much harder so as this plaster is setting up, I start packing it in there and I'm now going to use a slightly wet brush, just some water to sort of take off any gnarly textures to try and smooth that out. Uh, and then once that's done, I'm ready for my next mix. I always tend to do this in two mixes. So the first mix is the first coat or the firstings. And that's just like I say, to get a nice, uh, get all the details in there and to get a nice even thickness all over. It tends to naturally settle into the deeper areas. So um, you know, you want to try and keep it, I, I guess, about a centimetre, 10 millimetres, or just under half an inch thick all over. Try and keep it thin, because this is strong, you don't want it to weigh too much, otherwise your mould's going to weigh a tonne. Okay, so as that sets up, I go on my second coat. So this is now me applying the second coat of plaster, and you can see that it kind of goes matte after it's kind of been dried. So the first coat is drying up I want to put the second coat on as soon as I can the sooner the, the second coat goes on to the first coat the more it's going to stick if I left it overnight there'd be a good chance they wouldn't necessarily bond chemically um, so I really want to get this second coat of plaster on there as fast as I can and as soon as I brushed on a layer I'm then going to start dumping some pre-cut pieces of scrim or burlap into that plaster and I lay them on now my preferred way of doing it is to go over the edges first go all the way around the outside edge first and I overlap them so that the edges overhang and then I cover the center and then what I'll do is I'll put some bigger pieces in over the edge and then I tend to fold over the edges like this so that they end up being rolled layers of scrim so there's several layers thick on the edge and the edge is quite an important part because that's what you tend to grab hold of when you want to open the mold that's where you're going to stick a screwdriver in and hit it with a hammer that's where you might put clamps or bolts or something so the edges always tend to get the most amount of punishment so it makes sense for those to be really strong so uh, there's several layers of plaster and scrim on that so that's going to be a nice nice strong thick edge and again, as it starts to set up, you can start cleaning up the edges. Now, as this second set is, uh, the second layer is, is setting up, I also pull out the clay from underneath that I used. The first bit of clay I put around the edge here, I, I pull that away so that I can actually get to the edge of the plaster and clean it up and strike it off. And then I use wet sponges and, uh, you know, a wet um, brush to kind of smooth out that surface as we go. And if you can kind of treat the edges nicely and smooth them out then you'll get a nice square neat kind of finish on those corners where the where the edges are so a nice strong mold and it looks neat ish and looks quite controlled as that second plaster is starting to set up the first one is very very set so I can actually peel away the back so I carefully remove the plaster bandage wall and the clay wall I can now get to the other side so now you can see the reverse side and you can see where the keys were and now there's these little depressions which are the complete reverse of what was on there in the first side of plaster and I can clean all that off I'm going to use just a wet sponge to clean that down um, obviously as this plaster is setting up it goes through this gloriously cheesy stage and that's when I go in there and square everything off and make them neat so as you can see I'm going in here with the with the stuff as it's it's still liquid but it's kind of setting so there's this nice sort of five minute window where you can kind of uh, paste it in there and, and take out any inconsistencies and make it smoother and neat and then as it sets up you just hit it with some wet sponge or um, and you get that nice kind of smooth finish on the outside so I clean up the uh, the mold wall there you can see there's a little bit of uh, sort of residue of clay 
it's just a stain of clay, like you know, a light layer of mud. And because it's water-based clay, I just use a wet sponge and wipe that clean. Okay, it's very important to make sure that everything is clean. So I'm using here uh, a surf form or plaster rasp to shave things down. Very important to keep um, a, uh, a wire brush on standby to clean that out because damp plaster that easily shaves down can often get stuck inside the blades and you want to clean that off before it has a chance to fully set. And I tend to go crazy with this thing uh, early if you can, because this is when the plaster is still at its most sort of softest stage. It has set, but it's only just set. So it's much easier to shave down any bits and bobs you don't want now than if you were to leave it for a couple of days, because then you'll find the plaster gets to its full strength. And so shaving this stuff down is a real chore at that stage. So once this is done, I'm going to do the same thing again. I spray uh, a couple of coats of um, spray wax over the exposed plaster so that the next layer of plaster that goes on there will definitely come away nice and easy. And I leave that to dry for a couple of minutes. I give it two coats of plaster with five, uh, two coats of wax, sorry, with about five minutes in between each coat so that there's plenty of time for it to dry. You'll know it's dry when it goes matte. And then I'm going to do the same again. I put on a first coat of plaster. Same again, and then once that starts setting up, you can neaten it up and then go on again with your scrim and plaster. Smooth it out. And square everything off, make it nice and neat. So now all the plastering is done, I just need to drill in a couple of holes because I want to use bolts to hold this mold together. Um, I'm just going to use two uh, long bolts, uh, one at the top, one at the bottom of the mold because I don't think it needs any more than that. So I'm just going to drill some holes all the way through very carefully using a drill bit. Take your time because fresh plaster and the scrim and everything is still got a lot of moisture in there. It may be quite tricky. If you've got a masonry drill bit, you could use that. That would work quite well too. And then I can separate the two halves. I've got to use a screwdriver here to carefully pry them apart. And you can see that with a little bit of careful uh, prying, you can get the two to separate and they should come apart nicely. So there we go. You can see I've got some little bits of overhang of plaster which has sort of crept over the edge there. And I'm just going to smooth it out with some tools now. I can surf on this off or I could use a blade like here, like a Stanley knife or something or a craft blade just to kind of trim that off. And then make sure that any bits that are sharp to the touch are sort of smoothed down now with a rasp or surf form. Or you could use even like a coarse um, abrasive paper or wet or dry paper as well that would work and here you can see the two halves go together beautifully with a pretty good seam and that's the jacket made and because it's in two parts like I say you can treat it as a one-piece mold but if you do need to get it apart for any reason you can just take those two bolts out and then they'll separate into two separate shells whilst the silicon is still one piece so you won't have a seam on there it's just on the outside on the jacket so here I'm going to put the molds together with or the mold halves together with a bolt and I'm going to use washers to spread the load and also to stop the fact that the the spinning of the nuts could damage the surface of the plaster every time you're unbolting it and bolting it up again. So these big washers are really handy to spread the load and to stop it digging in. So now over to the silicone and I'm just going to give that a wipe down and as you can see the silicon is flexible so it just peels off and basically you just go around the outside surface peeling that all away and then I just hold it down the middle and just pull it completely off the face and the plaster face is largely this is the original plaster face it's largely undamaged the ears did break off but that's inevitable because you know they're, they're thin plaster pieces that stick out but it doesn't matter because the thing is we've got the mold so we can make more of these and there we go. This is our completed silicone. We have a little bit of silicone that crept underneath the plaster around the edge here. So I'm just going to go in and trim that off. 
and then I can pop this back into the plaster jacket. So to help the plaster jacket, or to help the silicon sit into the plaster jacket, because it's quite grippy, uh, I just use a bit of talc, and that'll help lubricate the surface of the mold so that the silicon can slide in and pop into place. And these keys around the outside edge, they just need to be fitted and pressed into place. And then once the silicon is correctly located and sat in there, that should stay in there quite happily. And there you have our completed mold. So out of this, we can produce multiple copies of faces in different materials. So we could cast pieces out in resin or different kinds of foam, or we could make, you know, a dozen different faces if we needed lots of different sculptors to work on the same face at the same time. And we're not worried about any damage to our original life cast because now we have an exact copy of the original in silicone and we can make as many as we need from this mold. Fabulous. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope that was useful to you. And please do check out our podcast if you're interested in prosthetic makeup and the processes involved. Todd Debrasini and myself produce a podcast called Battles with Bits of Rubber. It's wherever you find podcasts and we suggest you check it out, subscribe and get in touch if you have any questions. Check out Prosthetics Magazine. It's available online and in print and it's full of all kinds of information about prosthetic makeup.